Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the Neutral Zone on Mass. Um, I am Ray Tesley, and I just want to uh, introduce the folks who are behind the scenes, and that is Larry Fleming, Dan Scanlon, and that blotchy image you see on the screen that says Neutral Zone is Ashley Armstrong. Uh, and they are the brains behind uh, uh, our particular uh, live stream, and uh, they're going to help us along the way. We have a really entertaining uh, and a really informative evening tonight. Um, our guest is Lisa Hansel, who I will introduce in just a second. But I do want to remind you that uh, any of you who would like to ask a question, please do, please do. And we will try to get those uh, to Lisa as quickly as we can. So uh, we certainly appreciate you being here. And uh, having said all of that, let me introduce our guest for the evening, Lisa Hansel. Hi, Mom. Hello, son. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, I've been waiting for this for a long time. So thank <laughs> you for being with us, really. Um, so just to get started and, and fill some people in who may not know you, um, can maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background, how did you get interested in makeup and, and everything you're doing now, and, and when did you or how did you start making it a career? Sure. Um, <clears throat> in true Star Trek nerd fashion, I met my husband. Tim Vitito at a Star Trek convention in Las Vegas. You all know the one. Um, I was going to be cosplaying to Paul with the haircut that I had at the time, a very short Vulcan-y looking haircut. Um, I had a friend make a costume for me and I bought some ears online and I thought, all right, well, this will be fun. Let's go do this. And I was thinking maybe I would get some double stick tape from the front desk and I could put them on and I don't know what I was gonna do for eyebrows, maybe a pencil Sharpie I could get from the front desk. Anyway, I heard some friends telling me, oh, there's this guy in the dealer's room who does uh, special effects makeup, go talk to him. So I did and uh, I was able to, he, he did my makeup for the T'Pol costume and uh, a lot of fun so much fun and we became fast friends there was kind of a group of us if you've ever been to this to the uh star trek convention in las vegas you know how it is there is a group of people that you only see once a year and they are family 100 percent and um you have to go back every year and see them um the the gentleman who did my makeup at the time became one of these friends and eventually uh, became my husband, and he's a special effects makeup artist for, gosh, I'm, a, oh, I'm not even going to say the amount of years because, you know, <laughs> it was more than three. And uh, I started, I was very interested in what he did and um, knowledgeable about Star Trek. He's kind of more of a Star Wars guy, and so I, I brought the, the Star Trek cred, and we, um, we kind of teamed up. Uh, I had some prior experience doing makeup in the, the beauty industry. I'd been a model back when the earth was cooling and was always really interested in what the photographer was doing or the model, or the, the, uh, the makeup artist was doing. And uh, I just always thought it was really interesting how they were able to, like a makeup artist can sculpt features into a face that don't, don't even really <laughs> exist. And, I just always thought that was that was a fascinating field. So I was able to bring a beauty makeup background to our team of special effects and beauty makeup. And my husband also uh, is an, has an engineering degree and loves to build uh, custom props, uh, make dioramas, anything creative that you would need to really solve and get into and you know, really enjoy that sense of, I did that <laughs> when you're done. Um, so yeah, I, I teamed up with him and uh, we, gosh, we've done a lot of, a lot of crazy things. 
uh, over the years. That's that's one thing about this this job is it just never gets boring. There's there's something new around every corner. So I think that's a big part of why I love it. That's uh, actually very interesting. Um, <laughs> you you've got uh, both sides of the coin there. Uh, a professional teacher for you at the time and now your husband so that's that's actually pretty cool uh yeah, absolutely maybe staying with that just for a second uh we have a question from uh christopher collins and chris says uh what has been the most interesting makeup story working on star trek or a fan event thank you chris for your question um, the most interesting story. Um, that's, that's a tough choice because usually when you're dealing with a, a Star Trek fan event, you have, are dealing with a lot of people who are very passionate about the subject matter. And that, that level of devotion and emotion uh, can usually can bring some drama. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> um, uh, Probably my most memorable story, I actually wanted to tie into uh, uh, one of, hmm, I'm trying not to spoiler this, I wanted to tie into a story that I'm going to tell a little bit later Okay. On in the interview. I am so sorry, Chris, I've just ruined your story, but please stay tuned. I will answer your question, I promise. I knew I was jumping all over the place, which is what I do. It's what I do. Um, you know, I'm not going to ask you the question I was going to ask you, then I'm going to wait till you tell that story, and then I'm going to ask you that question. Uh, okay. Just one comment. Uh, Katie Wilson wrote in Hi, and said, Lisa, how are you so freaking amazeballs? <laughs> um, well, I am not ex I amazed like amaze balls is that something that you can like search on amazon i'm not exactly sure what that what the definition of amaze balls is i think it's probably good thank you katie for your question um and i don't know how to answer that literally i'm not familiar with amaze balls either but i have a feeling in the context it's a compliment <laughs> uh, well, thank you katie and the answer is i don't have a clue Okay. So, thanks. So maybe staying with it, yet another question, <laughs> which is wonderful that people are are really in, into this, really. Yes, uh, very Ruth, much so. Yeah, really. Ruth Weston said, how would you recommend someone who is interested in the field go about getting involved? Wow, that's a really great question. Thank you, Ruth, for that. Um, it would depend specifically, but there are a lot of different avenues in the field. So if you are interested in special effects makeup specifically, um, probably the, the very best education you could get would be the Dick Smith's Advanced Makeup Course. Google it. It's online. A uh, dear friend of mine, Andrew Clement, um, is, is running it. Dick Smith was the godfather of makeup, literally. <laughs> he created the godfather makeup. And he had an amazing philosophy of sharing his knowledge, uh, which isn't, isn't all that common in, in my line of work. Um, he felt that sharing knowledge, sharing the knowledge that he built or created himself meant that someone else is gonna do better and someone else is gonna better the craft. And that, that's what was most important to him was that the effects got better, not that the artists got better or more crafty <laughs> at hiding their secrets and, and, and keeping, you know, keeping everything under wraps. It was more important to him that the craft be better, that the craft proceed and evolve. And oh man, that man. Dick Smith, he's the guy. So his course, which is entirely offered online, is the best. Uh, Cinema Makeup School here in Los Angeles, headed by another friend of mine, Michael Spatola, is got, uh, it's, it, 
if you need brick and mortar, you need to go to a place and, and have your hands on something, to, you know, and have your, have your teacher right there. Some people, you know, people learn differently and that may be, may be your jam. Then the cinema makeup school here in Los Angeles is the best. You know, Lisa, I got to meet you during uh, Starship Farragut and then uh, worked a lot with you uh, or next to you or near yes. you on STC. And I know what my most amazing jaw-dropping makeup was, but uh, we did have a reader question that asked, what was the most difficult or maybe the most interesting makeup in Star Trek Continues? Wow, that's a big question. Um, there, there were different challenges for different makeups on Star Trek Continues. Um, the <laughs> painting Lou Ferrigno green again is absolutely a bucket list item for me and probably for any makeup artist that's over the age of 30. Um, uh, my most rewarding makeup, I think would be the, the uh, episode eight Old Kirk makeup, just because I was so pleased with how how it came out, how it all, you know, when you're doing something and it gets wrapped up in a nice little bow, oh, oh that feeling, that was it. it. That one turned out really well. Um, and there's there's a great story with that uh, regarding a certain nearby restaurant. I unfortunately missed that, but tell tell what happened uh, when I guess the decision was made to keep that, uh, that makeup on Vic. That was so much fun. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, because the makeup took five hours to apply. And let, let, I, I'd like to preface that with it, that was a three hour makeup that took five hours to do because you're doing it on someone who is also trying to executive produce a series. And everyone's coming in and asking him questions and he has to get up and he has to go put out a fire and then he's gonna come and sit down in the chair. Um, it. We didn't have one of the, shooting days, we were not going to have that kind of time in the morning. We just, our page count to shoot that day was just too high and there's, there was no way. Uh, so the decision was made that Vic would sleep in the prosthetics. Um, so we just, we just removed the, the, uh, the wig, which is a very uh, delicate late hand, hand tied human hair lace wig, individually tied hairs. Very, very nice wig. Put that aside and uh, went to dinner <laughs> at the sushi place in Kingsland, Georgia called Wasabi. If you're ever in Kingsland, go to Wasabi. Thank me later. Um, we walked in, we, anytime we would end up, we would end shooting and we would wrap. We would all go out to dinner, wherever it was. I, you know, We didn't get sick of each other. We all wanted to still hang out with each other after we were shooting for eight, 10, 11 hours. Uh, so we would go to these restaurants and they knew us <laughs> and we treated them kindly and they were always excited to see us, especially in this one restaurant. And um, I think the proprietor might have been like close to a stroke when she saw me walk in and say something to her. It was, it was really funny. Um, we, we got... <laughs> photos, video of him. We, it was literally a prank on the town to have to go out to dinner with him as old Kirk that night. And I, uh, you know what, I was proud because even under restaurant lighting, he still, that makeup still looked good. I got to say, I was sitting there going, yeah, I did all right. <laughs> That's pretty good. Did you have to, I'm assuming you had to touch it up the following morning. Yeah, I well, I did, of course, but uh, what was a five-hour makeup job turned into a one-hour makeup job, and I, I was pretty grateful for the sleep, got to say. See, the other interesting part was that it would be taken off and placed on the body double who would play the old Kirk from behind while Vic was playing the young Kirk. And so it got swapped back and forth, back and forth. If you look, you'll see it on a very talented uh, gentleman uh, who just said, yeah, I'm about the right size and I'll do it. 
<laughs> yes, that's that's an interesting story in itself. That ta talented gentleman was Greg Dykstra. Uh, he would he played Dr. Heath in episode five, and he wrote episode six, um, "Come Not Between the Dragons" with our rock monster Usti. Greg is family. <laughs> I know we we throw that word around a lot, but that it is never more appropriate with him. It's funny we were um, we were visiting Pixar. We often screened our episodes at Pixar and at ILM Industrial Light and Magic in the the Bay Area after they came out because they're all a bunch of huge nerds and kids and just they they are just like us in that they are professional filmmakers who nerd out at this stuff and grew up with this stuff and it you know oh, right here um so we were we were up in the bay area for one of those trips and vic and greg were walking ahead of my husband and myself and we were we were we had been discussing episode eight and that we would need a, a double and who could we get? And I realized, wow, you know what? Greg and Vic are the same height and they're kind of the same build. This could work. So we started talking about that. And yeah, you know, he's like, sure, I'm in, let's go. Um, we had through four, three or four different sets of the makeup. The prosthetics themselves were foam latex, which is kind of like a sponge material. So the upside of that is that it's very it's porous and it lets the skin breathe and it also will move with you'll you will glue it onto different muscles on the actor's face and so they can emote through it you know they're not just dead face latex people <laughs> when you put them on you can really see every every movement through them that's why i love them silicone prosthetics i know i'm getting off in the weeds here, but this is important. <laughs> Silicone prosthetics don't let the skin breathe, but they're more translucent. So when you're going into a project, you need to figure out what the needs are uh, and decide from there what, what you're gonna do. Anyway, sorry, digress. Um, we had three sets of these foam latex prosthetics. And uh, so I, we would rotate them through. I, I was not gonna throw on throw Vic's sweaty prosthetics onto Greg's face. <laughs> Sorry, I love both of these people and I'm gonna do the best I can to take care of their skin hygienically at, that I can. Uh, we would sanitize one set, let it dry overnight. Okay, this is gonna be Greg's double set the next day. So in essence, my team and I had two old Kirk makeups to do. One of them was mm, pristine, good enough for clo close-ups. And one of them was kind of slap it on and he's gonna be blurry in the background, but it, it was, it kind of doubled our workload in that respect. Well, to coin a phrase, that's pretty fascinating. Uh, <laughs> now, I know you sent us uh, a number of pictures from Continues uh, and we'd like to show those. There is a question that is actually a lead in, I think to that. Uh, and uh, Bob Kinney wrote, uh, how did you get involved with STC? Great question. Thank you, Bob, for that question. Um, <laughs> my husband and I were uh, turning Tim Russ into Tuvok one day. We were um, creating, we were turning him into a Vulcan for a, a Kickstarter fundraiser for another project that he was working on. And Ralph Miller, who is our sound designer on Star Trek Continues, was also working on this project. You maybe uh, there's there's a theme that a lot of a lot of people who work in Star Trek fan projects work across multiple projects. Ralph was one of those people. Uh, Larry Nemechek was also involved, and Vic Mignana, who created Star Trek Continues, uh, executive producer, Captain Kirk. For anyone who might not know, showed up while we were putting the um, the uh, Vulcan touches on Tim Russ, and we met him. Um, 
he stayed and became part of, of our project because he has an extensive background in film and, and, and video production, that sort of thing. And we just kind of needed extra hands and he was willing. So he jumped in and helped kind of direct while some, while Tim was in, while Tim Russ was in makeup, he was directing because Tim was supposed to be directing and you know we all just did what needed to be done. And um, afterwards, uh, Vic approached me in the makeup room and asked if, if I had a business card. And sure, here you go. And uh, he called, I think the next day, the very next day and said, let's go have lunch. I wanna talk to you about this project. Okay, great. So we met, uh, he, he and I and my husband met for lunch at a Marie Callender's in Glendale. And uh, he just started talking about this project and you could feel the waves of enthusiasm coming off of him. I, I, anybody who's ever spoken to Vic about Star Trek Continues will know exactly what I mean. Um, I've been working in the film and entertainment industry in, for 15 years and I, I can count on my hands, your hands, your hands, your hands, how many people have come to me going, I have this great idea and no money. I'm, that's, you know, that's a, that's a Tuesday in this, in this area, in this industry. And something about his pitch and plus, you know, it was about Star Trek and I've been a Star Trek fan since I could walk. So it, uh, it really tugged at my heartstrings and he seemed to really kind of know what he was doing and wow, this really seems fun. So we told him, you know, we'll think about it. <laughs> um, went home, thought about it because it was gonna be, you know, get, you're gonna need to pl pay for a plane ticket. You're gonna need to, there was no money then. There was, you know, Vic, Vic financed the first three vignettes and the first episode himself. Um, so he was, doing his best to gather people who had the most expertise and the most heart who might donate some some time to this to this project and we were some such people <laughs> that's how we got involved very nice and it's not exactly the story i thought you were going to tell i i thought you would have probably known vic prior Yay. to that no, uh, I love I love of surprising you, son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, one of these days I'm going to surprise you with how I got involved with Vic, but we're not going to do that tonight. Another day. Another day. Um, so, do we want to maybe start going through some of the picks, and you can certainly sure. emote yeah. as much as you want about them. So, I'm going to ask Ashley okay. to take the controls. There she goes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had sent uh, poor Ashley and Ray <laughs> just 11 folders of some photos from each of the episodes of Star Trek Continues. Um, it occurred to me, for anybody who doesn't know, this Star Trek Continues were, were shot on the Neutral Zone studio sets. And this was our home for five years. Uh, we, we came to space camp and we got back together with family and we shot these amazing stories just for the love of it for you know to to just to get it out there um this episode one called pilgrim, pilgrim of eternity i got to meet my 40-year crush michael forrest <laughs> apollo from the original series um our storyline in episode one is that uh, Apollo is caught in some time something and uh, ages rapidly and, and we see him again after only two years. Uh, you know, our Captain Kirk and crew see him just a few years later, but he's so much older. Well, meeting Mike Forrest and, uh, and his wife, Diana Hale, who played uh, Athena, in episode one was just probably, <laughs> they they are dear friends of, of ours to this day. In fact, I was just at their home a couple of days ago 
Um, love these people more than I could possibly say. Uh, this the uh, the on your screen. I don't know if it's going to be upper left or right for you, but I'm spraying I'm spraying kind of a a uh, a makeup sealer on Mike Forrest, and he made this sound like woohoo, like if you if you poked the Pillsbury Doughboy. That was the sound that the god Apollo made every time I sprayed something cold on him. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. Um, and then, of course, him being seated in the captain's chair as he rightfully should be, I thought was a, a lovely photograph to share with all of you. Um, and then the other photo of him in the, you know, the kind of blue overall thing. Uh, a, uh, a storyline from the Pilgrim of Eternity was that we learned that our hero Apollo actually gains his strength from the, uh, or, or in the past he had gained his strength from the adoration of his worshipers. And through our episode, we find out that he, he realizes that he can get the same amount of strength from selfless acts. So throughout the episode, we would see his strength wax and wane. Uh, when he, for example, the, the photo with him in the blue jumpsuit, that was when he was weak. You know, you can see he has less hair, he's a little more pale. Um, and then in other photos, for the, the, the shot of him in the captain's chair, for example, he's got some color and he's got some more hair and all of that. So we uh, we went back and forth throughout the entire episode trying to relay that uh, in the storyline. Well, I think we have some other pics as well from Pilgrim of Eternity. Yeah. Let's see what we've got. There we go. Do I recognize that person in the lower center? <laughs> Yes, lower center is the young man who was in the epilogue scene of episode one, Pilgrim of, of Eternity. Uh, as we're coming into that scene, we see um, a young boy struggling with a wagon, on a wooden wagon on a wooden, uh, a wooden wagon wheel on a wooden wagon. Wow, <clears throat> that was a lot of W's. Um, and he's, he's struggling, it's clearly like a pre-industrialized civilization. What's going on? He looks up and, oh, there's someone that's come to help him and it's Apollo and he's doing, like I was just describing, he's, he's doing something kind for other people. And he helped him with the wagon and, and he's walking off and he turns back and smiles at Apollo. And then we see that he's, he's the youngest that we see him this entire episode. Apparently he's been on this planet all this time doing good deeds and is back to his own old strong self. That young boy is my son. <laughs> oh. And he's, he's probably going to be really annoyed that I'm sharing this right now if he ever sees this, because, you know, anyway, he's, yeah. Uh, his name is Dathan, and he's fantastic. He's, he, that, he was 12 when we shot that. He's now a sophomore in college. Um, he, at the, at the time, when I was discussing the episode with Vic, he said, well, there's this one scene with this kid, but, you know, I don't know any kids. And I said, well, I got a couple, pick one. And Dathan happened to be the right height. And he got, um, he got recruited for the job. The other two photographs we have here are of Jamie Bamber, who was uh, our first guest star. No, actually, because we shot Michael first. Anyway, Jamie Bamber graciously came aboard uh, to, to just shoot out on the, out on the, on the, the hull, clearing off some stuff along with Grant Imahara, the two of them uh, in a, a scene or two were out there clearing off this junk from the hull. There's an, a phaser overload and you see this, this burn makeup that we did. Um, I think it's, 
see, you know, I look every, every makeup I look at, I'll, I can see, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. But I'm told <laughs> that folks think it looks great. So, you know what, I'm going to go with that. Well, folks think it looks great. So go with that. <laughs> go with that. Thank you, son. <laughs> You're welcome, mom. <laughs> Episode two, Lolani, Lou Ferrigno. <clears throat> Um, I remember we had dinner prior to this episode, we had dinner with Lou Ferrigno at Buca de Beppo's at City Walk Universal Studios. And uh, my husband and I introduced ourselves to him and explained that we would be doing the makeup. And he said, oh, it's great. I'm so glad to meet you. Can I be blue instead? <laughs> and so I explained to to Loon. Actually, no, that's not how Orion's work, but I promise you that you will not look like the Hulk. I, I prom this is my promise to you. You won't look like the Hulk. He said, okay, that works for me. So uh, when he got there, uh, I had the daunting task of shaving this man's arms. Oh my gosh. Talk about square footage. Um, it, it, it took a little bit, took a little while. Uh, the green that we used from, for anything that was not on the face for both him and for the young woman who played Lolani, whose name is Fiona Broom, the green that we used from the neck down on both actors was a, a product called PAX, which is a prosthetic adhesive plus uh, acrylic paint. And it doesn't go anywhere, which was necessary for this, this episode because we couldn't have green transferring onto the sets or other characters' uh, costumes um, that would have just been a nightmare. So PAX is the perfect product to achieve this. And then I would just, I would mix different cream colors to match the color of the patch, PAX in order to do the, the faces of both of our characters. Was that his beard? No. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, actually, it was his beard and mustache, and we added the, the danglies. Nice. nice. Yes. You know, I interviewed him after one of those, and he told me that it took four hours to put on and two hours to take off. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that, um, that green was as tenacious as it needed to be. Uh, we, we came in at roughly three or four every morning and we were done removing makeup. We started at some point, we started just taking, I, I remember taking Fiona back to her hotel and you know, pouring a glass of wine and pouring oil, oil and remover into a bathtub and saying, just soak for a while. Here's a glass of wine, let's just, Let's, you know, it was, it was a lot of work and we, my husband and I had the flu at the time as well. It was grueling. Episode two was hard. And remember that we had just started our, our series at the time and it wasn't, it didn't have the popularity that it did toward the end. And we had a skeleton crew. We, we just had volunteers with a lot of heart and no training and, it, it was hard. It was hard. And sometimes I think when you ace the hard things, that just, that makes them all the more sweet. Agreed. I'm losing my light, aren't I? Well, you jumped ahead there, Ashley, I think. Sorry, I think I'm losing my light. There we go. Three, there we go. <laughs> Episode three, the makeup challenges for this one were recreating second season looks um, as accurately as possible. As you know, as may, you may know, our, the goal of our series was to complete the five-year mission and kind of bring us, bring our characters to where we found them and Star Trek The Motion Picture kind of 
create a continuity thread there. And um, so most of our episodes would have been third season or later. And there were a lot, the looks were very different. Um, Uhura's wig, for example. I mean, that's classic second season. It's exact, it's straight out of, not only was, were we matching second season <clears throat> makeups and looks, we were matching a specific episode from the second season. Um, the, the wig, Kim Stinger's Uhura wig was created by hand by Hannah Baruki, um, a, an amazing costumer that, that yeah, yeah, she was part of episode one all the way through. Hannah's been there, was there, you know, throughout. Um, I got to recreate the Sulu scar from, from, oh my gosh, that scar was awful. Let me just say, I had a little conversation with James Kerwin. This was the first episode that James Kerwin joined us. Um, this was his script, the concept, I believe he and he and Vic worked together on this con this, uh, the concept and this was his script and he wanted to direct it. And this was really James's dive into Star Trek continues. And of course, you know, from, from there on out, he was, <laughs> he became absolutely indispensable and he's as much of a part of why STC is, has been so well received as any, any of us. Um, anyway, I remember having a conversation about the Sulu scar saying, please, I beg you, let me make a better scar. Uh, a lot of, a lot of other work that I've done has been purposely recreating the look of late 1960s makeup or early 1970s makeup, and, which is awesome by itself. I'm, I'm also a makeup historian. I, I love looking back through old Hollywood stuff and experiencing all of that but as you might as you might expect the techniques and the materials have evolved and a lot there things a lot more things are possible today a lot more realism is possible and um so it, it's it's been kind of a balance for me between recreating the look of the original series of Star Trek, which was number one, absolute number one, versus oh, making a really good makeup <laughs> because a lot of the makeups weren't, you know, they were they were top of the line for what they had in the day, but uh, there were some of them were a little painful for me to try to recreate today. <laughs> um, our guest star, Asia DeMarcos. Uh, there's a there's a funny story about how we found her. We were actually, my husband and I and Vic had gone to a store in North Hollywood called, uh, did we go to Mamie's or? Nigel's, Nigel's Beauty Emporium on Magnolia in North Hollywood. And uh, we were going to look for evil Mirror Spock um, facial hair. And so we met there and we went in the back and we were looking at stuff and, and um, kind of looking around the place. And Vic came up to me at one point and said to me, oh my gosh, don't look. <laughs> I'm like, what? Look at that over my shoulder. You see her over there by the cash register? It's Marlena. And I was trying not to look. And I looked at her and I'm like, oh my God. Gosh, you're right. That's crazy. She looks just she looks just like Barbara Luna, which call her Luna. If you ever see her in person, she's Luna. She's amazing. Anyway, um, so he said, "All right, oh, I need I have to talk to her, but you have to come with me so that she doesn't think I'm, you know, crazy." <laughs> I'm like, "Okay, well, good luck there." So <laughs> we we walked over to this poor woman who was just trying to check out in a store and said, are you an actress? And she said, yes, actually. Uh, she was in Miss Congeniality. She was Miss Hawaii, I think. Yeah, in Miss Congeniality. And you could tell that she had her radar up. Mm, 
you know, trying, she had her crazy meter on trying to figure out what was happening. And uh, she kept looking at me and I kept nodding like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. We're not crazy. And um, so uh, got her information, exchanged information and talked to her a bit more. And she was able, she came on. Obviously, she's a ringer for Barbara Luna. The two of them have met, love each other. Um, yeah, it was great having her on board. And, you know, I mean, you can look around the, the photos at all of the, all of the looks, like Chris Dewan's look. Um, that's, this is the only episode of ours where you'll see that kind of a hairstyle because that's what his dad, that his dad's hairstyle in this episode was just like that. And interestingly enough, the, the beard that we bought for Mirror Spock was a full beard. And of course, we did, I didn't need the sides. So I cut those off and I actually used parts of Spock's beard in order to recreate the Scotty look. So I, I was gluing parts of Spock's beard onto Scotty's head for episode three. Oh boy! What a good well, time. it all looks great. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> it all looks. I mean, I I might as well be watching the original series. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Obviously, that was our that was our goal was to bring back that feeling. It's all about the feeling. Episode four, the white iris. Um. The makeup challenges for me in this one are kind of similar to episode three in that uh, there were looks to recreate. Edith Keeler was um, played by dear, my dear friend, dear friend, Adrian Wilkinson, who you might know from Xena, the warrior princess, um, and I don't know, any number of other amazing things. She's fantastic. Um, and we also created Reina Kopek. Uh, the, the actress's name was uh, Gabrielle Fresquez, and we recreated Miramani. That actress's name was Tiffany Brower. Um, all the, these three, they, they ended up being Kirk's past loves that he needed to reconcile his feelings for in order to move forward in the story. <clears throat> and. Um, most of them were shot on green screen after we finished filming everything. We, they were on green screen in Los Angeles. And so this was a one day, all hands on deck, <laughs> makeup, makeup fest for that. Um, the only uh, past, Kirk's past love actor that, was, that came to the sets was Nakia Baris, who played the Nakia character. She was actually a yellow Power Ranger, I think yellow was her color and Vic had met her at uh, at a convention at some point in time and uh, they became friends. A lot of our guest stars were uh, came on board because of just meeting Vic at conventions over the years. Well that also answers a question I was going to ask which are look at all those hats. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, those were just there at the studio. They weren't, they weren't part of anything that we were doing. That was just there, strangely well, enough. It's, it's interesting that, you, uh, so maybe you didn't find the hats that I, we're seeing on uh, Edith Keeler and Miramani on the wall. <laughs> no, actually, no. They were <laughs> created through Ginger Holly, our amazing, amazing wardrobe supervisor who, by the way, just kind of a testament to the, the caliber of the people working on our show. Um, she recently wrapped season three of Ozark and, you know, is on to other equally amazing things, I'm sure. Um, are we, I'm really proud of the talent level that we had involved in our series. Uh, continuing on with episode four, the, uh, again, the Raina Kopic look-alike was really, gosh, man, those eyes. She just looks much like her. I'm kind of just kind of struck every time I see it. Our main guest star for episode four was Colin Baker, Doctor Who fame, of course. Oh, gosh, what a gem of a man. <laughs> and then, of course, we have 
Sarai. Oh my gosh, that little adorable thing. We had met her and her dad on episode three. He came to, to film some behind the scenes stuff. And then we realized we needed a, a little girl for episode four. Of course it was going to be her. It's a nice family. I, I know them well now and and uh, it's always great to see them. It's, it's glad they were involved in that episode. Me too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Episode five, Divided We Stand, is the um, <clears throat> reintroduction of Dr. Mumbenga, played by Martin Bradford. Uh, obviously, he was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, he... Poor guy couldn't grow a beard to save his life. He didn't have any sideburns. So we were, uh, our makeup challenge on him was uh, just creating sideburns and, and tying it all together. Really not hard. I just wanted to uh, underscore Martin's and Dr. Mbenga's return to Star Trek continues. That was really awesome. And we had a lot of fun with him on set. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, I, I, I personally really enjoyed episode five because there was a lot of blood. <laughs> we hadn't really done a lot of blood in our series up until then. Um, Blake Fowler, the old, old soldier, uh, pictured there. What, a, what an amazing actor. I've, I've just really enjoyed watching his career ever since we, we, I got to meet him and um, work with him at that point. Oh my gosh, what a, an amazing young man, young man. The people oh, like uh, me, everybody's a young man. Yeah. Uh, one makeup note I was gonna add with, with Blake was that his beard was stark white and a really good, um, makeup tip, I guess, uh, when working with someone like that is to darken it because it can really throw off color balance and just make that the only thing you see is this white, white beard. And that's an, an easy way to, to avoid that for film and television is to darken it a little bit. Yes, more blood. There we go. I was, that's a uh, lot, of, lot of fun, that blood. That's a great, Ugh. that's a great Abe Lincoln. <laughs> well, okay, Abe Lincoln is Matt Busey, our director yeah. of photography. Um, he, I, I spoke, he didn't want to be Abe Lincoln. <laughs> he told me on more than one occasion, he was like, I don't want to do this. But he was just, he was perfect for the role. Um, he had a full beard and mustache at the time. He refused to, to shave his mustache. So what you're seeing there is me gluing it down and, and putting makeup over it to make it appear that there isn't one. And he was gonna be photographed from far enough away that that was gonna be fine. I added the mole on his right cheek. He doesn't have one there. So I added a, a foam latex prosthetic mole that was not even visible in that shot, but I don't know, I felt better about it. And then the upper right picture there is uh, Greg Dystra the the gentleman that I mentioned before from who he's the senior creature designer at Pixar uh, now also consulting in different areas at Pixar uh, but he's yeah he's been instrumental in a lot of our successes how did you enjoy filming at Alesti I actually uh I had to leave a, a day early I wasn't able to go to Alesti um, I actually <laughs> I gave uh, Scotty Whitehurst, who played Billy Palmerton in this episode, I gave him a crash course on how to be a makeup artist uh, the day before because I was gonna have to leave. I had a flight and I had to leave. So he went out with, uh, with the cast and crew to a lusty and did whatever was, was necessary. Um, everything that we shot before that, before the actual battle scenes were on and recreated camps by Civil War reenactors. They weren't actually at Alesti. I have to say when Vic made the announcement that some of it was at Alesti, it kind of made my day in a sense. I grew up in the town that was right near it. So Alesti was kind of like a regular thing for me. And really? seeing the battlefield scenes, I actually went back to the battlefield for the first time this year. And 
I was like, I was like, oh, Star Trek Continues was here. Never knew it, and I'm from the town. So it was pretty neat seeing it and thinking about how everything was filmed out. Um, did you guys ever experience any of the creepy vibes? Oh, wait, you, that's right, you said the other guys, you were uh, out of town. But I know there's yeah. like a lot of people that report that there's like some creepy vibes going on on the battlefield, which don't Ooh. ever get yourself lost in those woods at night. Ooh. Really interesting. Um, I hadn't heard any reports, but I will, I'll check. If they're still alive. <laughs> right, yes. By the way, I'll have to say your, your Matt Busey, Abe Lincoln is better than the Savage Curtain. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that is that's high praise. I, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see what episode six coming up. Episode six. Well, our main character in episode six was a huge space rock monster, so there weren't a lot of. Weren't, I didn't have any makeup challenges with Usti. That was all the. Uh, that was Ed Edmonds, of. Creatures Unlimited, create, create, oh, oh my gosh, uh, uh, Denver, Colorado, Creations Unlimited, oh my gosh, I'm butchering this name, Ed, I'm so sorry, please uh, Google Ed Edmonds and Marsha Edmonds, wonderful people, um, they created the rock monster, Usti, from, um, from sculpts, sculptures made by Greg Dykstra, uh, I'm going to interrupt. I'm going to interrupt for just a second, Ashley. Yes. Can you move to the next frame? And there is Usti. There's Usti. Oh my gosh! Yeah, inside that suit is a gentleman named Damien Buer. Uh, if any of you are familiar with superhero beatdown, he's Superman. He's six four, strapping lad, huge nerd. There, there was just nobody else to uh, to be in that suit than uh, that and Damien Buer. He's <laughs> oh my gosh, Usti, what a great guy. Even so, even him, even being a big strapping guy, strong guy, he couldn't be in there for more than fifteen minutes without a break. It was brutal, brutal to be inside that suit. There was a, we had portable uh, electric fans running when, yes. when he would sit down on a stool. And I remember one line vividly. He was hitting that 15 minute mark and, and he wanted to continue and he did the scene. And then he looked out through that head piece and said, I'm like the Thanksgiving turkey. My thermometer has popped. That's so true. Oh my gosh. He had the frame was like a backpack frame, a really good backpack. Like if you're doing the Himalayas or something with the, you know, all of the straps and everything. And then there was a thing that came up over his head where he had a camera or he had a, a view screen. So the headpiece wasn't even on his head. It was forward of his head suspended with cameras so that he could see. Um, there, obviously it was, ridiculously hot. There was no breathing whatsoever. There was an entire team of people called Team Usti that were just, uh, they, their entire job was the care of the actor <laughs> inside that thing. And, you know, there was another guy off to the side with a whole computer keyboard who was, who was um, changing the, the colors of the, the lights and the eye and the head display. Uh, they were either blue for being calm or yellow for being slightly alerted or red for look out. <laughs> um, it, it was just a beautiful marvel of technology. And how, how original series to have a dude in a creature suit. Really? I mean, that's just absolutely very not late 1960s <laughs> Star Trek. So and classic. He, and, Usti, and, Usti lives in Ginger Holly's living room <laughs> now. Currently, I'm sure he's gonna he's gonna get you know passed around, but currently he resides in our wardrobe supervisor's living room. 
And uh, do I recognize uh, a certain Roddenberry in that? Picture? Yes, yes, that's Rod Roddenberry there on the left. He was a guest star for our sixth episode. He's been a family member and a friend of our series from, from the get go. Uh, he, he recognized that we get, <laughs> we get his father's vision. We, uh, we understand all of that. It's not about pew pew and where's the Klingons. It's not about beaming down to planets. It's about the human condition and um, so much you know, the deeper the deeper themes underlying the the, the episodes. But somewhere exists a blooper reel. Somewhere exists a blooper reel of him running out of the turbo lift onto the bridge and going ha ha ha! I'm a red shirt. You didn't get me, and they got him. <laughs> Yes, that's true. It is, it's in there. There's a good nugget to go find. <laughs> Episode seven, Embracing the Winds. Uh, another James Kerwin original. Um, guest stars Claire Kramer from left to right here. Claire, Claire Kramer from Buffy the Slam, <laughs> Buffy the Slam Pyre Slayer, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She's a absolute delight to work with and such, mm, such a, a good, genuine, through and through person. Love her. Erin Gray, same thing. We saw uh, Commander Gray make a, a cameo in episode two of Star Trek Continues, and she re reprised her role here for episode seven. And it was so great to work with her. We got to chat backstage about she's a Tai Chi master. I myself am a, a second degree black belt. And she's a Tai Chi master, and and we just had we oh, we just bonded over that sort of thing backstage uh, in a way that we didn't have didn't have the opportunity to do before. So I was really grateful for that. Uh, next is John Champion. Love that guy. Love you, John. Are you here watching? Uh, he played uh, Hadley in in our episode seven. We're so glad to have him join, uh, you might recognize him from uh, the his his podcast through Roddenberry. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on, oh, John, don't kill me. Uh, no, you can kill me later. I'll think of it later, I promise. Uh, okay, and uh, we have Bo Billingsley played uh, Admiral Ston. No, Admiral God, man. Okay, Ray, kill me now. At, he played a Vulcan admiral in episode seven, and uh, that this is this is the this is the question. Remember the makeup question? One of the most memorable makeup things that ever happened. This is it. Oh my gosh. Okay, I was in a hurry, and I was putting his ears on, and ordinarily I would set the glue bottle down because I know it can happen but I was in a I was in a rush and we were behind and I was holding the glue bottle as I was applying his ears and I ended up spilling the entire bottle of glue down his shirt into his shirt pocket which contained his phone and you know how, how they say that like your vision becomes a tunnel and everything stretches and it's slow motion all of a sudden. That was that was that day. I this is my first day meeting Bo. I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, he's I've enjoyed him on on film and television my whole life, big fan, and I've just done this ridiculously rookie thing. <laughs> and poured glue onto his phone into his shirt pocket and he turned to me and said nah it's fine it's an old shirt I, I fell in love with this man right there on the spot Bo mwah, I love you thank you for recognizing that I was about to implode in that moment and having kindness and compassion for me Oh my, that was awful, but 
Bo is a, an absolute pro and I love you, Bo. <laughs> you know, Bo has a wonderful voice. He's an actor who you've probably seen in a, a number of prescription ads of late playing the, the happy grandfather, but as the guy holding the microphone to hear that, that beautiful, those beautiful tones of his as he played a Vulcan Admiral, uh, that was one of the highlights of working audio on, on this production was to work with Bo. I'll bet. I'll bet. Vice Admiral Stom, someone says. Thank you, Dan Martin. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Okay, episode eight. I, I touched on this earlier. All of the, uh, all of the old age. Center, center photo there. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, before and after, Vic Mignogna as young Kirk and old Kirk. And uh, just some touch-ups there in sickbay. The next slide, Ashley, or I don't know if slide. Um, the center photo there just kind of shows that yeah, the makeup, makeup always extends to hands. You know, if you, makeup for te film and television is never, never stops at the jawline. If you don't get all exposed skin, it's gonna show. So uh, I just used a, a standard uh, latex stretch and stipple technique to age the hands quickly, adding in some age spots and you know highlights, shadows with uh, Skin Illustrator, an alcohol-based pigment that will not sweat off or wash off or, oh, it's great for this sort of thing that needs to last for a very long time. It's alcohol activated, so alcohol is the only thing getting it off. Um, lower left, you can see there was a, a series of, in episode eight, there was a series of, of captain's logs where we show him stranded on the Defiant over time. And so I had to do some subtle aging techniques over time. I think there were three or four of them. And Matt Busey, our director of photography and our amazing camera team, number one, uh, locked off the camera so that you know the shot would be exactly the same and we would run back to the makeup room and change something you know go a little bit older a little bit older and run out shoot some more go back a little bit older a little bit older and uh that was that was fun that was kind of a you know a quick and dirty what can you do out of your kit quickly with pencils <laughs> and some gray hairspray uh lower right there is our <laughs> old kirk double that's greg dykstra I, I had just slapped the wig on him. There's no forehead piece. I'm looking at, I'm looking at it. Yeah, oh my gosh, that's horrible. Uh, but it doesn't matter because we're never gonna see him that close, right? We're never gonna see him in focus. We might see some hair from the side or a chin. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what a stunt doubles prosthetic makeup looks like. It looks awful. <laughs> okay. I think we have a time lapsed uh, version of uh, going from oh. young Kirk to old Kirk, if you want to show that. Yes, please. Awesome. That's perfect. The process. Wow, uh, that's that's really amazing. Um, the looks on the on their faces behind, they're so over it. Look at them. <laughs> it was a five hour makeup. They're like, "Are we done?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, Which would explain was... why Vic slept in it. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I can imagine the looks he got around town. Yeah, well, the, yeah, that, just that one night at the, the sushi place was the only time he really took off out of the, oh, he, you know, he probably pranked the people at the hotel. I'll bet, I'll bet he did. I wasn't there, but I'm sure, I'm sure it happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least it was, it was a very good job as one who was there. Seriously, it, it stood up beautifully, uh, right up nose to nose. And he had the mannerisms with the look 
and it was seamless. Oh, thank you. It was. Thank you very much. Um, episode nine. Oh my gosh, we have John Delancey and Anne Lockhart. Oh, be still my heart. I love these people so hard. Um, the idea for the black and white thing was that um, a lot of people, when Star Trek first came out, didn't have color. Obviously, it was made for color television. Look at the colors, right? But a lot of people didn't have color televisions yet. And so their first experiences of Star Trek were in black and white. And so the idea was, uh, Vic had this idea for an episode that started off that way and then ended up in color. And I just think that was a, such a, a brilliant concept. Um, with <laughs> get, deciding on the, the colors that our characters would become was not easy. I did a lot of makeup tests, so, you know, where are we going to do? Can do blue skin, okay, that's Andorians. Can do green skin, that's that's Orions. We don't want to go there, so we're going to do, oh, well, maybe we do the green hair and it's blue, it's blue skin. Or I, I tried so many different color combinations, and I remember having a conversation with Vic and <laughs> talking about how I just don't want our esteemed guest stars showing up on set looking like a set of a bowl of hard candies. And that's what, that's what a lot of the makeup makeup tests ended up looking like. Um, so we, we landed on yellow skin, purple hair for one of the races and orange skin, black hair for the other race and did tests on that and, and desaturated them, looking in, at them in black and white as well and making sure everything looked like, it, like we would want it to. And uh, yeah, that's what, that's what we ended up going with. It was a hard, hard um, process of elimination. And episode nine is the introduction of my character, Svetlana Papanovich. Um, <laughs> she didn't really have a name. Um, the, the whole, the, the name came out of a blooper that I thought up on the spot, but um, we were actually shooting episodes nine and 11 all of episode nine and part of 11 were shot at the same time that we were all in, in Kingsland there on the sets. And um, it, it had already been, I had already begged to be in episode 11 in this one role that I saw that, oh my gosh, I had to have it. Whole series, I didn't have to have any role, but this one I was like, please, that had to be, had to be me. But James Kerwin recognized that there was one scene in episode nine where they didn't have anybody at the station on the bridge and they needed somebody. And so James was like, hey, I need you to jump in on the bridge. So I did. And um, that was this, I, yeah. So I didn't crash the ship, pretty happy, pretty happy about that. Got to drive it with my girl, Kipley. And uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun for episode nine. Lisa, I've got one makeup question here. Obviously, it took four hours to put Ferrigno into makeup, but this was a different kind of makeup for these characters, was it not? It was, it was, it was uh, air, air brushed on, right? For uh, the episode two characters? Yeah, it was for not... what would ships are for? That was a uh, um, Over what, freight what on, right? Was... Um, no, actually, that was, uh, that was cream makeup. Okay. For them. Yeah, especially uh, mixed colors, custom custom colors that I created, mostly from Ben Nye brand makeups, which are industry standard. So here we are at episode 10, To Boldly Go is the first part of our two-part finale series. <sighs> okay, can we talk about Amy Rydell <laughs> as the... Romulan commander. Amy is the daughter of Joanne Linville, who played the Romulan commander in the original series. And she just, uh, I mean, she, here's a great story. Um, I brought in my dear friend, Tom Supernaut, who is a two-time Emmy-winning makeup artist, nominated three times. 
worked on all of the Star Treks, all of them, uh, X Men's, things like that. Um, he loves Star Trek just as much as I do. So he's a sucker for this sort of thing. And I, uh, I brought him in and he did her makeup. Oh, so the, oh, I'm just so happy. So happy with how it turned out. In fact, once her makeup was complete, she took a picture and she sent it to her brother. And her brother said, oh, is that the reference picture they're using of mom to do your makeup? <laughs> That's when I, Brilliant. Uh, yeah, that's Brilliant. when I knew, yeah, okay, I guess we're good. <laughs> if, her, if her brother thinks that's her mom, I'm good. And, and good. seriously, when she walked on set, you could hear every jaw drop. Yeah, oh yeah, everything stopped. Mm -hmm. Everything stopped. It was amazing. Um, we had the return of Martin Bradford as Dr. Mbenga. It was so great to have him back. We had... Uh, Cass Anbar as Sentech, a, uh, a Romulan Vulcan, Romia Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> if you've seen the episode, you know. And Nicola Bryant, oh my gosh, love her. Uh, you'll remember that we had uh, Colin Baker from Doctor Who as our guest star in episode four. Well, uh, Nicola Bryant played her, uh, Colin Baker's doctor's companion and anyway it's all very convoluted and amazing and uh colin had introduced nicola to us in the green room at gallifrey one one year which is a a doctor who convention in los angeles and suggested that we have her as a as a uh, as a guest star and sure enough there we go there she is she was amazing she is such a spitfire she played such a strong character and her all like she's like 80 85 pounds and five feet tall and she just commands the screen she was a lovely lovely woman as well we have a uh, some more yeah coming up oh <laughs> okay so my character made another, this is the other place that my character showed up, was this, I had read the script for episode 11 and read the part where the saucer separates. And knowing what a completely iconic moment that was, I needed to be part of it. And I read that it was, you know, Lulu and Kirk and Pruman. I'm, I need to be crewman right now. I immediately was just, I, yeah, I need to be crewman. And so, you know, Vic and James were like, whatever. And so <laughs> that's, uh, the upper right picture is me in the scene. The center picture is me not crashing the ship. Uh, I thought it was funny. Uh, upper left is uh, interesting that a lot of people have commented on the episode 11 scene where Spock is being uh, manipulated by espers and he thinks that there's a whole, you know, bow, chicka, bow, wow, scene happening in his quarters with the commander and it ends up not being real. What most people don't realize is those two actors were, were not together in that same scene. This young man, Devin is his name. He stood in for Spock uh, while she did that scene. And then on a completely different day, Todd Habercorn, who played our Spock, act, acted the other half of that scene opposite someone else in a brunette wig. So you'll never even you'll never even uh, realize that if you're watching it um, natively, um, if you if you don't know that. And I just love that that's part of the movie magic. <laughs> yeah, you you answered a question. I was saying that is not Todd, and I don't remember that scene looking right. quite yeah, that no, way. Yeah, that was his stand-in for that scene. He was never there. He wasn't even on. He wasn't even in Kingsland that day. <laughs> 
Oh, episode, okay, part two of To Boldly Go, episode 11. We had pyrotechnics. We had sparks and stuff. That was really fun. And it kind of made everybody go, yikes, you know, there's fire on set. Our, uh, our crewman ru running right there is, um, her name is Amanda Dinkler. She was a makeup artist on my team. Yay! Love you. And um, down in the lower left there, we've got Larry, Larry Nemechek, our Dr. McCoy from uh, episodes one and two. Um, I mean, of course, Larry was family. And, and, and after episode three, when uh, Chuck Huber rejoined the cast uh, and Larry took more of a consultant role. He's, he, you know, would show up at all of our, 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 our shoots and, and be there and support us. And so it's great to have him be part of our crowd scene. Toward the end of episode 11, there's a huge, there's a scene where there's a huge crowd in Starfleet Command and that is what the crowd was. There were like 30 of us and we would just, we were at a high school auditorium in Kingsland, Georgia. And we would sit there and we would go through the scene where it was like, oh, okay, now gasp. Oh, okay, now clap. And we all did that. And then we would get up and move back an, a row or two rows or whatever. And we, and we shot that scene over and over and over until we got to the back of the, <laughs> back of the auditorium and sent that to um, the to John Knoll of Industrial Light and Magic, ILM. And he took all of that and created the final scene that is just, it's beautiful. Oh my gosh. Being Starfleet Command, you, you just, you feel like you're there. It, he did an amazing job. And it was such, such an honor to have someone of that caliber enjoy our work so much that he wanted to be part of it. And I, I think there's a, a bonus photo and you're going to have to explain this one, but you sent it. So it's here. Oh, I did. I just wanted to often, a lot of people don't, uh, don't realize that my husband, Tim was also a makeup supervisor also on this. He and I uh, often team up on projects because we have very different um, different uh, areas of expertise and strengths, and I I'm I'm the Trekkie, <laughs> so Star Trek continues. I took point on so a lot of people see it as oh Lisa was in charge of makeup. No, we both were in charge of makeup, and um, I there you go. There's there's the other face, the other half. <laughs> of the team and yeah i just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware that it, it was a two-person team and they were both wonderful to work with wonderful to watch working they'd have their little hip uh, pouches with touch up running around because we had hot studios cold studios sweaty studios and they had their work cut out for them indeed indeed well, we did it's it it nice fun. to it's nice to virtually meet your husband <laughs> <laughs> Someday we need to do. How is that? How is that possible that you haven't met him? Well, unless he accompanied you on the couple of times that you came down for a fan weekend, you know, I I had no idea you guys were in Kingsland, Georgia, nor did I know where Kingsland, Georgia was. <laughs> That's uh, true. And and the, the just a, a funny story. By the way, I'm never going to look at. STC in the same way again. I'm, I'm just not. Good. This was, Yay. This was just glad. wonderful, all this behind the scenes. Um, but I had been invited to come and see the studio after you guys had finished. Um, and I remember talking to Vic, and Vic said we're in Kingsland, Georgia. So I rented a, you know, I got an airline ticket and I flew from Fort Lauderdale to Jacksonville. And all I remember is the plane went up and the plane came down. And I said, where the heck am I that I'm taking a plane to go 10 minutes? So uh, <laughs> it was an interesting, it was a very interesting trip, but that was, that was really wonderful. And, and like I said, 
I know I'm never going to look at it again uh, the same way. Um, let me, um, so we have about 5,000 questions from about 4,000 people. Um, I would love I, to take them all. I don't know what your time is. I am, I'm good. I'm losing fine. light. I like to kind of turn on a light or something, but I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, I lost the sun. No, if you want to turn on a light, you can certainly do that. We, we, we understand. There you go. Okay. Talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to mute. So for many of you who, you know, we, we've been listening to, to Lisa talk about um, her work and her adventures on STC, uh, but Lisa's been involved in many other productions. Uh, maybe we can touch on some when she comes back, and now it looks like she's back. Uh, but if you look behind me, uh, these are, <laughs> these are, uh many of the productions that she worked on so we'll talk about that in a second you feeling better mom yes okay i thought i unmuted but no i boomered it i boomered it good <laughs> you did it you did okay. it i was just letting everybody know to behind me are many of the productions the other productions other than stc that you worked on yes and yes I'm, I'm just curious if there's any of those that really stand out to you uh either in a good way or a bad way <laughs> well i'm i'm not likely to highlight some bad ways but um looking <laughs> the first one of course that stands out to me is when the train stops it's a short that i produced recently um, that has, I, we actually just got an agent for it and it's out for distribution. So yay. Um, it stars Vic Mignogna and Michael Forrest and John Delancey and just, oh my gosh, it was so, so great to bring a lot of, a lot of the family back together and do something. Um, I was going to, I had kind of teased in, uh, in some of my, in uh, the, the Facebook video that I did a couple days ago that I might have some surprises. Uh, what we had, what you and I had discussed, son, Ray, um, is that I was going to be uh, donating some of my private collection toward, toward the goal of raising funds for the work that you do, taking care of our our beautiful sets that we that we shot on. I, I still say our. I know they're yours, but they're ours because you know I'm their mom. So <laughs> um, a lot I hear from so many people. I've I've done until just recently. We've had a lot of people come on and help with the social media for Star Trek continues. Thank you. And, um, but for eight years, it's been pretty much me. And I've seen so many people mention that they wish they could have been, they wish they would have heard of it sooner or that they could have been involved or they could have been, could have been, you know, contributing financially to our, our series because they felt that they got so much out of it themselves that, that, a 50 year hole, a 50 year void was filled with uh, the stories. And um, really to, to all of those people, I wanna say that you still can. You absolutely still can. And this is how. You can help support the nonprofit organization that cares for her, cares for our girl, for the enterprise for the, the sets that we love so dearly and that we spent five years of our lives on, there's, liter uh, there's literally probably blood on the walls still. There's probably still just little nicks that could tell so many stories. There, there are imprints of our lives are there on those sets and they mean so much to us. So if 
anything that we did meant anything to you and you have any inclination to return the favor or give back in any way, you can do it. You can do that by financially supporting the Neutral Zone Studios and keeping keeping our girl flying. You know, she's oh, I. Mm. If you've ever toured her, if you've ever toured her, you understand what I mean. You walk the second the doors open and you walk down that corridor. Mm. There's nothing like it. There you're. You're 12 again, you're 14 again, you're whatever age you were when you first realized that Star Trek wasn't just television. Um, so to that end, I have, <clears throat> I have some items I want to donate. I'm, Ray and I are kind of talking about how it is going to work. Either I'm just going to send them to him and he's going to figure out how to turn them into rent and lights, or uh, perhaps I could, if anybody has any ideas on how to best go about liquidating my collector's items to benefit the studios, please let me or Ray know, because uh, I don't know, I'm out of it, I, I, I don't have any idea. <laughs> so um, if, if that's all right, Ray, I'll just go ahead and start kind of this is kind of a segue because you talked about other projects and there's something else from when the train stops that I've decided I want to donate as well. Okay. I, I would like to just jump in for a second and say, yes, I certainly more than appreciate um, what you just said. Uh, and, um, and you guys who are watching and listening who have been to the sets and maybe our existing patrons, you know what Lisa's talking about, you know what I always talk about. Uh, I always say if someone had told 12 year old Ray Tessie that one day he'd own the Enterprise, then I'd say you were crazy. Um, but we, we do need help and we know a lot of you are already helping. Uh, I would ask whether you're already a patron or if you can't afford uh, putting in any money or donations because we understand what the climate is these days. Uh, spread the word, please spread the word. Uh, let people know we're there, let people know. And, and when Vic and I went into this venture and I, and I did buy the studios, but we both agreed that it wasn't going to be a money-making opportunity. Uh, right. It was going to be for fans of the show. And one of these days coming up, I will tell you fans that I've met uh, and their reaction. And, um, you know, you can't ask for more than that. So thank you, mom, for making that that statement, um, that empowering statement. Uh, and if you guys can't help in some way, please do. And actually, before you move on, you've heard Lisa and I calling each other mom and son. Uh, and I asked her if it would be OK if I told everyone why. And I first met Lisa at the first one of the first fan days. And a mother is someone who nurtures you and advises you and keeps you on the straight and narrow. Um, and uh, Lisa has done that for me. And she is my go to person. Um, and whenever I have something that's like, you know, how do I get through this if it involves the studio or the sets or whatever? I'm like, well, I'm going to call mom and see what she has to say. And she has, up to this point, she has never steered me wrong. So mom, I want to say publicly, thank you. And I want to say publicly, I love you. So thank you. Aw, thank you. I love you too. And you know that you and I are some of those rare and treasured people who tell it like it is out of love and care. And uh, I think you and I recognized that, that pretty early on about each other and went, okay, 
he's that guy she's that girl we can do this all right cool you know we, we've got we've got that person awesome and uh we have such a mutual love for for star trek and specifically for these sets um that that's that's going to be the first thing that is that's going to be the thing that's that's foremost in our mind is taking care of of that and of each other you know i i'm proud to call you my son eat your vegetables <laughs> well thank you mom and uh, i'll do my best <laughs> right on okay so i would like to show some some uh collection items collector's items uh from my personal kind of collection from star trek continues that may be of interest to some of you um they will become available uh to be part of your collection in some form or another uh that we don't know yet so <laughs> this is all hype 100 percent hype here we go you came for the hype you know you did um first off we have <laughs> These are signed ear tips signed by Bo Billingsley. These are the ear tips he wore in episode nine, Embracing the Winds. Oh, uh, I feel like you're not getting a good view of them. Anyway, um, on this one, you can read the Billingsley. And on this one, you can read the Bo. <laughs> so, there you go. Um, yeah. All right. So next item would be from episode 11. And I'm really sorry I didn't pull up a photo of this, but uh, this is from Ambassador Tharn. Uh, no. Thesp. Tharn was episode three. Thesp. Uh, April Hebert. Love you, April. <laughs> Uh, played in Ambassador Thesp in episode 11, our Andorian, obviously. These antenna were cast from antenna that were created for the Deep Space Nine Trouble with Tribbles episode by my dear friend Thomas Supernaut, who worked on the Deep Space Nine Trouble with Tribble episode. That's not the name of the episode. I'm so sorry. Please don't kill me. Don't take my Star Trek nerd card. I'll I'm help you. On the name I'll, of the I'll, I'll help you out. It's trials and tribulations. Tribble, trials tribulations. and tribulations. tribulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. These were cast from molds from that episode by my dear friend who worked on that episode. Um, they're they go in. They're part of the wig. Like you put the wig on. There are forms on the inside that conform to a head. Um, you would probably need to position them and sew them in place for your head. These are specifically for April's head. The wig itself is a, it's a synthetic white wig. I will include uh, matching makeup for Facebook or for, for the face Facebook. Wow. Um, so, hey, Halloween, Halloween is coming up. That's a thing. So this will be available in some form for collectors. There, there's only one. This is the only one that exists. And that will be the case for all of the things I'm about to show you. This is Old Kirk's wig from episode eight. This is hand-tied human hair. Some guy, can you imagine? Some guy tied, hand-tied these hairs into lace. Now you can see, I mean, obviously this is a screen use piece. There's still makeup from the episode there. There's still skin tone makeup, probably some <laughs> Vic DNA in here. No doubt, actually. Um, we had cleaned it in between 
in between uh, takes, but the last one, I probably didn't clean it. Anyway, uh, we also have the human hair extensions worn by Amy Rydell as Commander Charvenek is her name in episodes 10 and 11. These were the extensions that were worn by the commander in our finale episodes. Uh, collector's item. One, two, three. And the last thing I'm going to offer is a signed poster from the short film that I produced when the train stops. Signed by John DeLancey, Michael Forrest, Rekha Sharma, and Vic Mignogna. It's an 11 by 14 poster. Oh, am I getting this right? Signed by the cast. That'll also be available. Oh, you know what? My blue teeth, the tooth is cutting out. I need to turn this off and There we go. Can you hear me, Ray? I sure can, Mom. Okay, good. Whew. Look at that. Easy transition. So those are the items that I will be offering from my collection. <laughs> and, uh, we'll figure out the best way to make them available to you. 100% of the proceeds from anyone wanting to acquire these things will go toward keeping the lights on and keeping our keeping everything ship shape in bristol fashion aboard uh aboard our starship sets in uh in kingsland so definitely keep an eye out for that uh, i will personally post about it publicly on facebook i imagine ray will neutral zone studios will perhaps the star trek continues official group will as well so it'll be out there just if any of these things have caught your eye, you have to have it. I mean, private message me, make me an offer. The, the goal here is to keep the lights on in Kingsland. And that's, that's what's most important here. So please reach out if any of these things is, is a must have for you. Well, uh, I appreciate your generosity. Um, I'm almost thinking you shouldn't send those to me because they'll never see the light of day. Uh, <laughs> but that is, that is very generous and, um, very cool that you would take from your own collection. Absolutely. And put it Absolutely. The Anything to help you out. And, and like I said, if, if anybody has any ideas on how best to turn these wonderful items into rent dollars, by all means, hit me up and, um, the, uh, the best idea is what's going to happen. Yep. And let me just say that, as Lisa said, 100% of this is going to go to the studio. 100% of this is going to the studio. Um, what was that, Ray? What did you say? Could you say that again? <laughs> I said, as much as 100% of what Lisa is donating is going to the studio, any money is collected is going to the studio. And, you know, it's interesting because we do have overhead it's not exorbitant but you know right now a lot of it's just coming out of my own pocket or the generosity of of the building owner uh and we're just looking to try to get uh to a point where we can just pay the rent we want you to come and see this place we want you to come and make a a fan film we want you to take pictures we want you to be there and i know Right now, it's a little difficult traveling because of, of COVID uh, and what's going on in the world. But um, but this is here for you. Uh, it's not here for me. Uh, it's here for my mom whenever she wants to take advantage of it. But <laughs> but uh, uh, it's it's here for the fans. And just again, we're just looking for some help to pay the rent and the utilities, and that's all we're looking for right now. So thank you, mom. 
You betcha. And there's a uh, there's a fan appreciation weekend coming up, right? That um, is not next. What's what are the dates? It's uh, Friday and Saturday, October 23rd and 24th. Uh, we are going to open up the studio again. We've been closed since April. I think we had a. Uh, I've been taking care of of our girl, uh, but we want to try to get it. Uh, you know, back up and running so you guys can come see it. Uh, certainly, if you're local or don't have to travel too far, it's, 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 a, it's a, a good deal for you. Uh, but we're going to try to do this. We just have to see what the climate brings. Um, and we're doing it a little differently. We're asking people to uh, pick a time and a day uh, so we know that you're coming. Uh, and we can limit the people. We're, we're trying to do everything we can in terms of social distancing and safety. Uh, so well, you just go to, to neutralzonestudios.com and right there at the top of the homepage, you'll see a big giant link <laughs> that talks about <laughs> Trans Day. Big giant link. Big Love giant it. Link. That should be episode 12. That's fantastic. <laughs> it should be. The it big giant be. link. The big giant link. Um, oh my gosh do you, you want to well, take that's great that you're doing um you know you're being really careful to um take care of you know um public safety as well as offer such an amazing experience for people to come and see a piece of history <laughs> yeah, a piece of history is right yes. it's, it is amazing it's amazing when you walk through it um, and I've had people hug me. I've had people cry. I've had people who are just so spellbound that they couldn't move when those doors open and you see the corridor and you know where you're standing. Um, and it's something that everybody needs to see. And I know there are, you know, several other places that you could go and, and you can certainly... Uh, see some of what we have there. In some cases, you might see all of what we have there, but there's no place that you could walk in and touch and feel and film um, quite like this, in my own humble opinion. Uh, that's and you true. are, and you are, <laughs> and, walking, there, and there's no place else that Star Trek Continues was filmed. That's a hundred percent, a hundred percent. If I may, know, if I, I, I may, just interest, add, right. let me just Fine. add one more thing, Dan. So, you know, I think, I think Lisa talked about sort of like the, the ghosts of the past uh, are at the studio. And actually, as you walk around, and it started, it, I will admit it started pre-continues uh, uh, with Starship Farragut. But every episode that has ever been filmed, whether it's Continues or Farragut or any of the fan films that have been filmed since, everyone picks a flat which is one of the walls and on the back side of the wall of the set is everyone's signature who contributed to that and you'll see handprints and you'll see drawings and it's really an amazing place to 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 spend time uh if you're a star trek fan honestly i can't say well i will say there's nothing like it there's nothing like it i'm sure somebody will tell me that i'm wrong but that's okay <laughs> That's so true, and I love that. I love that tradition, the uh, the signing of the of the walls. There are so many amazing productions that have been able to to film there, and the cool thing is is, I mean, even if it's not going to be Star Trek, it could be spaceship. It could be so easily redressed into you know, any other sci-fi or, or spaceship non-infringing <laughs> material so easily. It, you know, it, such a quick redress and you're shooting something that is not a copyright or trademark, trademark issue or, you know, there's none of that involved. So I love that the, the, the versatility is there as well. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Dan, I'm sorry I cut you off. It's okay. My one memory that, that Lisa certainly remembers is when Michael Forrest was redoing Adonis and he was in his toga, he was in his sandals, and he was waiting to do a scene in the transporter room. And he's sitting out in the corridor. It's dark. He's looking at a laptop at the original Who Mourns for Adonis. And here I am sitting right next to him as he's looking at himself all those decades ago. And I'm sorry, that's my geek moment of all from Star Trek Continues. I'm sitting next to the great God Apollo, watching the great God Apollo as he's about to play the great God Apollo. I remember that. I remember that. I walked, yep. I walked down the corridor and I saw a look on your face, Dan. And I was like, do you need uh, a call 911? Do you need a defibrillator? What happened? Are you okay? And you, you pulled me aside and explained to me what had just happened and I got it. Oh my gosh. I oh yeah. It. I'd have felt the same way. And we had moments like that. Uh, you know, we had many moments like that during during that production. We had moments like that um, when I got to run onto the bridge in uniform one time. And and I also, I, when you put my uh, Romulan ears on me, I believe, for, for one scene that I did for another fan production. So I got to a little bit of your makeup work done. <laughs> That's true. I remember that. That was fun. It's a pity that makeup didn't take, Dan, but that's okay. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Son. Yeah, I'm sorry. Ray. Yes, you're Ray. right. Sorry. Apologize. I am sorry, Dan. <laughs> uh, oh do we want to? Do you want to take a couple of questions? I know uh, we've been. I'll off take a while. as many questions as you like. I I have been droning on for almost two hours, so I'm I'm here until you kick me out. Okay. Okay. So uh, going through a couple of these, uh, our friend Shari, uh, who many people know as the, uh, the uh, wristband lady. Uh, oh my gosh. I love her. She's actually one of, uh, she's one of our uh, mods on the Star Trek Continue social media team now. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Sherry. Yes, I saw that. I saw yes. that. Yes, she is. She's fantastic. Fantastic. So she asks, has anyone had uh, an allergic reaction uh, to a, a massive makeup job you've ever done? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, no. <clears throat> um, I'm aware of all of the common allergens involved in makeup and have been able to thankfully Oh, uh, avoid, <laughs> avoid that. Uh, latex is the number, the latex allergy is very common and with uh, prosthetics, latex can be one of the things that is most problematic. And um, so I, I know to look for that for sure. But anytime I'm working with someone new, the first thing I ask is, all right, what are your allergies? What are your sensitivities? And on top of that, I already, I already by default use uh, things that are non-comedogenic, that are hypoallergenic, all of the genics. <laughs> sounds like that was the right answer. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Chris Collins writes again, and he says, have you ever interacted with makeup artist Michael Westmore? Senior, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about senior. I'm a dear friend of junior as well, but yes. Oh my gosh. Um, one year at, um, at the Las Vegas convention, I was actually doing a Cardassian makeup on the floor and I heard my name called and I knew the voice, it was Larry Nemechek. Larry, love you. And I was like, yeah, Larry, whatever. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 I want to introduce you to someone. And I turned around and he was standing there with Michael Westmore Sr. And I, <laughs> hello, great to meet you. And he was like, oh my gosh, can I see your sculpt? And I was like, it's my husband's sculpt actually. He had sculpted these Cardassian pieces and I, and I handed them to him. And I'm like, <clears throat> like you, you'd imagine, 
and he looked at them. And he's like, this is really great. This is really good. And then he proceeded to explain to me his, his, uh, uh, his, uh, what's the word? His inspiration for the makeup was a cobra painting or a, a cobra mixed with a, a painting, a Japanese painting that he'd seen. And I was just wrapped in this story that he was telling me. And then a couple of years later, I was, we had won the Burbank International Film Festival for one of our episodes. And we were on stage accepting this award. And he was seated in the front row. And I got to stand on that stage and look him in the eye and tell him exactly what his work had meant to me. Oh, it doesn't get more bucket list than that. Uh, it's a once in a lifetime, perhaps situation. Absolutely. That it was amazing, amazing. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, another friend of ours, John Powell asks, hey. Hey, John. Uh, what's the longest you've traveled for a job? Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. I mileage wise, it's probably going to be New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say New Zealand would be the farthest I've ever gone for a job. <laughs> Ordinarily, of course, you know film productions want to save money and hire local talent. Um, so it's not all that common <laughs> for someone who works in the indie film level to be, uh, to be working overseas. But that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I'm just running through these questions because you've actually answered a number of them already. Oh, good. <laughs> So that's I like, good. I like to be efficient. Yeah, well, I, I, I'd like to be efficient myself, which doesn't always happen. Uh, uh, James Robinson asked a question, and James says, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming, I'll assume you may know the answer to this. Uh, Vic uh, has said that there, originally he was planning to do 13 episodes. Uh, were the two episodes ever written? If so, uh, are they out there for us to read? They were never written. Um, there were ideas for more episodes that might have been fleshed out if we'd had the opportunity, but it's not like there are lost episodes of Star Trek Continues floating around there. There aren't scripts out there. Um, any any further episodes were at the idea stage. So, no, <laughs> sorry. Uh, let's see. Um, well, you've answered that one. It's a question about, this is from Gary Akers, who asked about filming in black and white and the, how, the, how you did the makeup. And you've already addressed that. Um, were there any times where the makeup process messed up uh, a schedule of filming due to how the makeup was executed? I think that's a little terse, um, but that's okay. No, I get it, totally. Um, yeah, anytime you're doing a makeup on a, on, a, on a time schedule, when you've got that first, your, your first assistant directors in the doorway going, it's really stressful. <laughs> you have to go, okay, artistry, time. Artistry, time crunch. Of course, I always want to opt for artistry, but I, you have to look at the, uh, the big picture, the overall the production picture. Um, episode, as far as Star Trek Continues is concerned, episode two was big time that because 
uh, again, we were early on in the in the series, and we didn't have a lot of resources at that time. And uh, sorry, this is beeping at me. Um, we didn't have a lot of, res of resources at the time, and so we were we were cutting we didn't have personnel or financial resources at the time we were cutting we were cutting corners and trying to make things work and it like our first our first batch of pax paint the adhesive component of it was too watered down in that batch and it wasn't doing the coverage and so that meant extra layers that had to dry in between and so you've just added an hour and a half to your makeup process because of subpar chemical not chemicals but subpar materials yeah there have been i i i'm, I'm struggling because it's like every single one i take as a personal hit like oh i remember that one oh oh so it's hard to just recall a, a serious struggle in a makeup that doesn't make me go <laughs> internally. But episode episode two was uh, was definitely that. There were a lot of, of challenges that we were, besides the fact that we both had to flu throughout. That was not fun. Working through the pain. That's right. The show must go on, as P.T. Barnum says. The show must go on. Well, um, I think we've looked at all the questions that people have written in, uh, but I have uh, one or two last questions for you, if that's okay. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have expected anything less. <laughs> right? With all of the work you've done, whether it's STC or when the train stops or renegades or non-track, whatever it is, is there anything you're most proud of? Oh my gosh. That's a hard question. I'm proud of, of different things for different reasons. Um, I'm obviously very proud of Star Trek Continues because the subject matter is so, so dear to me. And it's been so well received. We've won so many awards, yada, yada, yada. Um, the real paycheck being people who say, oh my gosh, you have brought a 50 year closure, you know, to this series for me, which is what I felt personally. So knowing that other people that I've never met felt the same way about work that I did, huh, that's humbling in a big way. So I think heart-wise, STC is the thing that I can say that I put most of my heart in and got very little mon monetarily out of it. Like, you know, no co costs were covered, but the paycheck has been 100% emotional. And that's why, you know, if you love what you do, that's, that's your most important paycheck. Landlord doesn't care, <laughs> but, but um, your heart does and your soul does. And that, that really matters. Other work wise, um, producing when the train stops was a biggie for me. Um, it's the first thing that I had produced completely myself from start to finish. And uh, of course, with an amazing team behind me, but like being, getting closer to people like, oh, great story. I didn't, didn't share. John Delancey, episode nine. I had I came to I came to set one day and my neck was jacked. I had slept wrong. I had hugged somebody wrong. Whatever happened, and uh, I was complaining in makeup. And I said something about you know getting a, a chiropractor appointment, and uh, John Delancey turned to me and said, 
well, I'll take you. So sure enough, right after lunch one day when, you know, everything worked out that we could do it, John Delancey took me to my chiropractor appointment and he sat in the car for an hour and a half while I was doing it. And when I was done, I came out and he was waiting in the waiting room for me, asked me how I was feeling and drove me back to set. That's a thing that happened. You know, there, are, there it, aren't paychecks that can be attached to things like that. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, maybe just as a last thought, I'm staying with that story. Um, I, and I assume just like many other fans who have attended billions of conventions over the years, have met you know, billions of actors who have been in Star Trek and some who have not been in Star Trek, but have been in other, other productions that you know and you love and whatever. And they, they, the reaction that you just shared about John is kind of what you see when you talk to them. And it's nice to know that that's really the way they are. It's, they're, they're just nice and good people and it's it's just kind of crazy but you know what they're they're people i mean we might look up to them but they're still people yeah i mean at the end of the day they are people who are very good at their job their job just happens to be very public very public i'm good at my job you're good at your job <laughs> we should be just as celebrated <laughs> and generally most actors, I mean, some are jerks, okay? Some are jerks. I've been very fortunate to work with people who aren't, who get it, who have good hearts, just like John Delancey, for example, one of many. Um, they understand and they value people who uh, also understand that they're doing a job and they're happy to do it, and they're glad to have a job, and they're glad that you appreciate that they do their job well, but you also do yours well. It's all good. We're all people. That should be a poster. Ah! <laughs> Hashtag something. I don't something, know. right, exactly. <laughs> well, maybe we leave it at that for the night. Um, I want to thank you again, not just for being with us, but for your generosity, your 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 uh, your love of, of this whole thing that we're trying to do. Um, and you know, uh, I want to thank you for being you. And I I miss seeing you in person. And we'll we'll get to that point again. But uh, I want to thank you very much for being with us. And uh, just to mention that uh, this will be up on YouTube probably within a day or so. So uh, have people come and watch us, not just on Facebook, but on YouTube. Uh, but this has been wonderful. And I really want to thank you for, for being a part of this with us. Thank you, Ray. It's been great to be here. It's always great to see you. I wish I could come and be part of the... Uh, the thing coming up, but you know, life is life. And I'm just really glad that I could be a part of this production. Thank you so much, Larry and Dan and Ashley for making it happen for, you know, being behind the scenes. And I've talked your ears off for two hours. Holy cow. But I've really Lisa, enjoyed Lisa, it. Lisa, thanks really for just letting me myself. work with you. <laughs> Ditto, Dan. Ditto, you know that. I look forward to it happening again in the future in post-pandemic times. Post-pandemic. Uh, yeah, I'd hate to think that this is the new normal. No, no, the new normal is what we make of it. There's uh, another poster for you. <laughs> another poster, another poster. So uh, I'm gonna play our end credits uh, for just a few seconds here and then we're going to sign off for the night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mom. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you, guys.